sophisticated investors know how to leverage service and tools, harvest knowledge, and capitalize on platform performance. There's one platform for all the markets, Australian and worldwide. Seize the opportunity. Get the demo. Saxo Capital Markets. No compromise. Welcome back. Now, my next guest knows all about how to boost productivity in your business. Nicholas Barnett is author of GPS for Your Organization, a guide on how to energize your employees and build sustainable high performance. Well, the book uh, sets out to show readers how they can develop, communicate, as well as embed their own guidance and positioning statements, that's the GPS, into their organization's plans, their decision-making, messaging, culture, indeed their DNA. Barnett saying uh, his strategy can be applied to all types and sizes of organizations, from startups to well-established. Join me from our Melbourne studio just a short time ago. Carson, look, it's a big challenge, and I like to actually illustrate it by asking people, and I often have 20, 30 people in a room, and I ask them to close their eyes for a moment and then point to a nearby town. And what you see is, if they keep their eyes closed, they're pointing all over the place. So I use that illustration to illustrate the fact that it's the same in companies that if you ask the majority of employees, or even if you ask the senior employees in most companies, they will actually be pointing in different directions as to where the company's going and to its chosen direction. So that's the big challenge for companies these days, is to get all their employees aligned around a similar direction, a similar purpose, and also buying into the same values. The and that's yeah, the big challenge. The, the buy-in is so important, is it not? You, you talk in your book about core values, and you, you indeed look at a company like Nokia. Uh, some of the taglines, they're engaging you, achieving together, passion for innovation, and very human. And yet, ultimately, uh, all of that can be construed as motherhood. As we know, a company like Nokia is struggling immensely in such a competitive environment. How have the core values demonstrably helped them? Yeah, look, it's a great point, Carson, and there's two big issues for me in this, and one is, one, you need to get the rational mind to buy in. So people need to be clear about where they're going and they need to understand why that direction is important. But ideally, you also need to buy, get the buy-in from the heart and the emotions. Mm. And if you get both the buy-in for both and people are engaged and on board, then they're going to be far more energised, far, far greater clarity of direction, and they're going to use their discretionary efforts that they wouldn't otherwise give to, to achieve the objectives of the company. Banks, of course, have been in focus uh, this week uh, as much as last, and they will continue to be here in Australia with the reporting and uh, with the growth strategy being picked over as never before. You're critical of one of the big four in particular. You don't name it, but I understand you've been referring to NAB and one of their uh, vision statements. You, you regard it as totally unrealistic at a point in time. Why so? Well, one of the banks uh, in around the year 2000 had a vision statement of being a major global financial services company. In other words, or actually a leading financial services company globally. Now, that is a huge statement to make. And if you think about it as an Australian bank, how can an Australian bank be a, a leading bank in this country or region, or even a commercial bank in this region, let alone a leading commercial bank globally. Mm. And then if you say, well, financial services company, not only do they need to be a leading commercial bank, they need to be a leading institutional bank, a leading investment bank, a leading funds manager, and you add all that together and you say, that's not really realistic for an Australian bank. Mm. So let's bring that back. and. Uh, and most, most uh, banks these days now have actually sharpened their vision and sharpened their focus. But indeed, West and mainly Bank, it's uh, around okay. Australia. Well, it is mainly it's around Australia and New Zealand, though, and perhaps that's where the, the limits uh, have to be, I suppose, limited to. But what about thinking big, Nicholas? Whatever happened to that in, in amidst all of that? If, if Facebook had kept its intentions modest, would it be the behemoth that it is today? Look, I think it, it's a really good point. 
Carson, mm. we do need to think big. We need mm. to, and that's part of engaging the hearts and minds of our people. Mm. And we need to think big. Do we just want to be one of the leading companies or do we want to be the leading company in our particular space? And these, these are, but they're critical strategic questions, Carson, because you've talked about the banks. Now the NAB currently have more give, less take. Yeah. Now that's, they've got to think really carefully about such a tagline because when they make a statement like that, that says big things, that sets their strategy up for years to come. Mm -hmm. They can't change that next day or the day after. They've had that now for almost three years. It's essential that they stick with that for at least another couple, in my opinion, because they can't change from one thing to the other. But having set that, that's, that means they need to be a lower cost than the other banks, otherwise they're not going to make the sufficient profit. So there are some very big implications of making those positioning statements mm. and they need to be really thought through because they impact the strategy mm. and the business of the bank every day of the week. Uh, you, you're stressing as well in the book the need for visibility that everyone can see these objectives almost literally are being pinned on the wall. One thing's back to the Sun newspaper uh, and that, uh, that essential, that billboard hanging up in the newsroom, the Sun, the best newspaper in the world and then look what happened. So, in that sense, how would you diagnose what might have gone wrong? Yeah, so that's a really good point because I think in the old days, Carson, lots of companies thought, well, everybody does vision statements, so we should do a vision statement as well. And they did the vision statements and they hung them on the wall, but they didn't really live them. They didn't really embed them into the way the thinking of the organisation and the way that it did its induction, the way it did its performance management, its recognition and it didn't make it the basis of its strategy. So these things became empty words. So an organisation needs to live authentically. So it needs to be serious. Is that vision statement something we're going to live by? Will it guide all our decisions? And those are the critical questions. So you've asked me a specific question. I can't surmise on that one, but the critical thing is authenticity. Don't bother with these vision statements unless you're going to live them authentically. The buy-in as well. You stress the needs for boards to be united over all of this, but also for employees to feel that they've inputted into a, a lot of then uh, what emerges as the core purpose, the core values, the aspiration, and perhaps even the golden goal that you, you add to that list. Um, how is that to practically occur given the size and indeed spread geographically of some of these organisations? So that's one of the big challenges with a huge 30,000, 50,000 person organisation. But it can be done and it's, it's often done when the vision statement is and the mission and the values are sort of first established or when they're reviewed and you can have representative groups around the world. Um, you can do surveys, de deploy a lot of this through surveys to ask people questions and views. And then you need an ongoing process to say, well, here's, this is the stage we're at. Now we'd like your view on, on this because this is what the particular committee have come up with. And, and as you go through a process, you're getting that buy-in all the way through. And people are aware that this is a critical uh, part of what you're thinking about. You talk about leaders uh, needing to be strong enough to realise that uh, not everyone is going to be prepared to come on this journey and so, in some respects it may be better for all concerned to, to wave or say goodbye to them. But what's to say that that journey is indeed the right one and that those who've resisted aren't indeed the ones that have made the right call? Yeah, look Carson, really another really important point but at the end of the day the leadership of the organisation, the CEO, the board, the executive team are responsible. They're the leaders and they're the ones that are critical to buy into this, sign off on it. And once they've done that, then there is no turning back. It's their vision. Now, it may be the wrong one. They may have been made some, a whole lot of bad decisions, but once they've made them, they need to sign off on them and say, right, we're going to embed this into the thinking, the DNA of this place. We are determined to make this happen. And if you're not on the bus, if you don't believe this is part where you want to be, if you can't have your values aligned to the values that we've come up with as being critical for us to achieve our uh, aspiration and, and direction, then you better get off the bus. What about changing the bus driver after about five years to extend that metaphor? If indeed you haven't got to your required destination, who ensures then there's accountability at the top? Yeah, another critical question because 
some CEOs are great at building, some CEOs are far better at maintaining, and some CEOs are far better at working through downtime. So critical questions, and that's something for the board to, the board and the chair to be really in tuned in on. Is this CEO the right person for the, for the future strategic needs of our organisation? And when is it time to change? And, you know, five years, seven years is often a time when organisations think, OK, what do we do next? And it's really up to the board, and, and the board is absolutely accountable for ensuring they've got the right leadership, so it's their role. Are you comfortable that you've, you've given enough emphasis to that very point in the book? Because one wonders as well of the role of succession planning. So whilst all this is rumbling on, you wanted to uh, survive uh, your tenure at the top. Uh, are chief executives giving enough thought and indeed practical uh, practice to that very topic of succession planning? Look, I think um, a lot, some are very good at it and some are not so good, Carson, there's no doubt about that. But in terms of context, and my book's all about that long-term direction and purpose. And I think BHP Billiton's a great example because they came up with a, what they call their charter. And they came up with it in 1999 and it's actually outlasted four CEOs and ideally that's that's the way that for a big company like a BHP Billiton they'd be so clear about where they're going what they're trying to do what their values are that they don't need to they might change a CEO but they don't need to change their direction does that make sense yeah so that's that's critical tell me about uh, the, the input of family into this it's it's, uh, it's a collaborative uh, oeuvre really, I mean in terms of what, what emerges here with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the diagrams, with the, with the graphics, uh, <laughs> just, just work me through that one, you've, you've involved um, the, the children. Well Carson, I'm really glad you asked that question because, uh, so here's the book and that my daughter Elizabeth actually designed the cover, she did the illustrations, she did, did about 12 or 13 illustrations in the book, my son designed all the diagrams and did the layout of the book and my youngest daughter Sarah also had an involvement in those diagrams so I'm a very proud dad and very proud to have a book out particularly with uh, such a big family involvement. Nicholas Barnett there, that's our show. Thanks for coming, see you in seven days. There are machines that can do things for us. Machines that can see right through us. And machines that want to replace us. But they are not us. There is one machine so instinctive, so seductive, it's as alive as we are. It doesn't click or buzz. It roars. Jaguar. Stay warm and dry this winter with an RM Williams dry skin jacket. Right now, when you buy a pair of our Australian made boots, you'll receive a dry skin jacket free. RM Williams, wholly Australian owned. Introducing the Target Essentials Kids Long Sleeve Tee. Soft cotton, great for layering and available in a classic range of colours. Always reliable, always trusted quality. They'll outgrow it before they outwear it. And only $5 every day. Target Essentials. The target quality you trust at the everyday low prices you love. And if it's Target branded, you know it's been Target tested. I've been working with Yo-Yo Ma for 25 years. And we were friends long before that. We're close. In fact, sometimes he gets a little too close. We simply love working together, creating together. I can't say I know much about banking, but shouldn't it be the same there? The real world affects the financial markets. Make the connection and start CFD trading. This program brought to you by IG Markets. Get thinking. I think 2012 will see um, the ramp up of our big projects. We continue to manufacture cars. We've got to look after those profits. This is Sky News Business, Australia's business channel.